appreciated about, um, because I, I've always believed even as a young child that miracles were everywhere. You know, that wasn't, I mean, didn't, uh, it, and they happened all the time for me. And it was a constant world that I lived in, and I know that I, there was a distinct period of time when I just decided that, I, I guess being an adult meant you had to deal with problems or something. And then the world of miracles and things happening easily um, just ceased to be, I, I got entrenched in the world of tasks and bills and all the things that seemed more real than the effortlessness of things occurring in their own time for me. <laughs> and um, also the, the ego that I was developing as a young adult was saying, you're bad, who do you think you are? You're not, you, you think you're special? What is the story here? And the developing spirituality was everyone is one. So how could you think different? You know, then I had to deal with all the, the equation of everyone being equal, yet I, I knew something to be true and experienced it that way. But the really great thing about what you're saying is that it really wasn't me manifesting that. It was me knowing that I was loved and cared for. And that it really is kind of a, a game of, of, um, of a, a play of images, a play of events that seem to be happening simultaneously. It can't really be looked at or quantified any particular way, but if you I'm losing the track because I'm feeling self-conscious, but um, that spirit is the thing that you connect with that has it all happen. And the and the knowing that it will happen, that um, the play of events, however they turn out, are in favor of my, are actually, I remember thinking, it's just an experience of me being loved. Over yeah. and over and over and over. And anything I came up with was so short-sighted and limited yeah. when I tried to maneuver it. And I was very clear about that. And I don't know when I lost sight of that, but I'm yeah. really excited about letting go because this is too hard in that way, for, 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 first of all. And second of all, I know this, and I think we all did. You know, as much as we we think that there's a there's a whole egoic experience of um, being in this fog or whatever, there's also this knowing. That's yeah, here. and the, the thing I think it's really helpful to remember is that that nothing gets yanked away. You know, it would be too frightening and too threatening to just have it yanked away in, in an instant. So there's lots of signs and symbols, lots of signposts along the way, like to let you know that you're on the right trail. Like, for example, I, I mean, I worked, even after I started studying the course, I worked at different jobs, and the last job I had where I actually had a paycheck and was, you know, receiving money from, for seemingly doing work, was I was teaching psychology at an art institute. And the way that I got that job was, I remember I was, I was called up and this woman said, you know, would you like to come in and interview for a psychology teaching position? And so I said, sure, and I went in. And I just, at that point in my work with the course, I didn't really see interviews as interviews anymore. I mean, I really had nothing to lose. I was just, I was like, whether I would get the job or not, it was not even in my awareness. So I'm just showing up to shine my light. I just go in there and I'm, the director is interviewing me and I'm just happy, happy, shining, <laughs> shining, letting it pour through, pour through. And she says, oh, this is great. Can you come for a second interview? I said, okay. <laughs> so I came in the second and I just let her rip. Happy, happy. No pressure. You know, because I was like, if I get the job, if I don't, it doesn't really matter to me. It's kind of fun going on into an interview where you don't care if you get the job or not. You can really be playful with it all. It's almost like play acting. And then at the end she said, oh, I liked your ideas and I like your smile and you got the job if you want it. And I said, okay. 
And it, I said, now what is this job? And she said, it's like, it's four hour, it's four hour classes. You have to teach psychology for four hours. I, I'm like, four hours? I've never even taken a four hour class. That's, but I said, oh, okay. And then after she went on and on about it and said, just sign these papers and do this and this and show up on such a day, I said, how did you even get my name uh, to call me? And she said, oh, uh, I had your resume. And I said, oh, I was, I was guided to delete my resume about a year, a year and a half ago. Uh, <laughs> my word, we had word processors back in those days, mm -hmm. instead of computers. And, to, and she said, oh no, I had your resume. And she went back in the other room and she came out with this eight and a half by eleven resume that had dust on it. It just, she went, <laughs> and blew all this dust off of it. And she, she said, oh yeah, there was this old stack of resumes from years ago, I guess maybe five years before that, I probably sent out a bunch of heaps of resumes, you know, to different institutes and whatever, and there it was, and she said, so I just, something inside me, was just like a little hunch, said, just look at the, the phone number on the, the top one, and it was my parents' phone, and I happened to be at my parents on the day that she called, and just, and I answered the phone, and she said, would you like to come in for an interview? Well, I, after that experience, I was like, well, I could see, Spirit, that you are not limited, you know, by, <laughs> I was like, okay, use the symbols in whatever way you want. And that was the last job that I had in a formal kind of sense, but I needed that job because I was very shy, I was voted most quiet in my senior class, uh, and, and I was not used to public speaking. So to have a four-hour class, uh, that's a lot of public speaking every week, you know, four-hour class. And then, as I got closer to when I would start the job, the Spirit told me, now, you can have a syllabus, but just put meaning of life topics on the syllabus for every week, and you will have no lesson plans. <laughs> and I said, you've got to be kidding me, a four-hour class and I'm not allowed to have lesson plans? And the Spirit said, no, this is part of me, I will teach the class through you. Uh, and it'll be wonderful. My ego was just freaking out. It was like thinking, you know, I could see maybe getting through an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, and all of a sudden going completely dry, and having all these students going, duh, they pay you the money to teach us and you just, you can't go dry, you know, it's, yes it's a four hour class, but you've got to keep teaching. So I was afraid I would be tongue tied, I would just freeze up at some point. But it didn't work that way, the Spirit, the Spirit taught A Course in Miracles to these art students, not using the words God or Christ or Holy Spirit or any of those, just using contemporary words, psychological words, present moment, kind of like, uh, Maybe like Byron Katie or something, you know, it's like coming through in a very non-religious way, which would have, it would have been inappropriate actually to, to use those words in that setting. And then after a couple semesters of this, I, was, I started to relax. Also, the Spirit would guide me, I, mean, I would be taking the bus downtown, and the Spirit would say, get off and go to the library. <laughs> and I'd say, the library? What's, what's this for? <laughs> We're renting a movie. We're going to show a movie to the class today. What movie is it? I'll tell you when we get to the library. So I go, go to the library, go through. The Spirit would pick out the movie of the day. The Spirit would give me the topic, which was usually on the syllabus already. And then the Spirit would teach the class through me. It's really pretty easy. It's, you know, it's kind of cool. And you get a paycheck for this too. It's amazing. Uh, and watch a movie. Nobody had ever shown me a full-length movie in any class. I never took a class long enough <laughs> to, to have a full-length movie. But we could have discussions, and Spirit would set it all up, like we'll be doing this weekend, setting up movie clips, when we'd have the movie, and then the Spirit would have a great teaching at the end of the movie. And it was spectacular. Because you remember, these are like art students. These are not really even psychology majors. These are not counseling students. And I was teaching all about defense mechanisms, and the mind, and consciousness. And I would show the movies, and they would go, projection, denial, repression. All right. <laughs> they, they could see it acted out. These are like Academy Award winning actors and actresses acting it out for art students, who are very 
you know, concrete. They know their colors, they know their, their photography and their graphics and so forth, but they're not, they weren't trained like philosophy majors or counseling majors. So the spirit could easily use the movies to reach them in a way that they could, could handle it. So that's what I found prepared me for my work around the world. Uh, Karen and I were talking earlier today at the, this picnic table and she was saying, a, a guy that shows movies to talk about mind training and healing. Yeah, Hollywood, you know, some of the movies were obviously made to gross a lot of money and to make a lot of money, but, but there's some really good stuff in the movies, and they can be used by the spirit to point out these uh, metaphysical uh, stepping stones that help us go inward. So that's just another good example about how it wasn't my plan, but yet it was just given to me, and it unfolded so effortlessly. And by the time I left that job, it was the I was told this is the last job that you'll have, kind of in a formal, worldly setting. The spirit said, "Now you're mine. I'll use you in ways that you can't even imagine." But it was very practical, you know, it, it helped pay off some debts. Uh, I, I got to overcome some of this shyness and fear of public speaking. I got to teach what I would learn. I got to teach the course, you know, in a public setting. And, and so it, it did serve for what was to come. But um, I just tell you that example to show you how practical it is. It's not like the, it's not some kind of airy-fairy approach to just, you know, wiggle your nose or Click your heels together and, you know, there you've got it. It's, you know, it just takes willingness to follow what's, what's given intuitively. So would you say that the ultimate goal of all human beings is to surrender to the Spirit? To that part, or that, that which they are, in other words? Yeah, I was saying earlier that to the ego it does seem like a surrender. Because the ego ha believes it has a will of its own. Yeah. You know, it's like that song, Frank Sinatra did, I did it my way. <laughs> even, it's, even some of it's like false humility. Yes, there were times I'm sure you knew that I bit off more than I could chew. But through it all, you know, it's just the whole song, I did it my way. Actually, Frank Sinatra was out, I believe, in, in Vegas when he got to be up in years, and he literally fell over face first on the stage while he was singing, I did it my way. Uh, when I first heard that news item, I went, hmm. Yeah, that's what happens <laughs> to the ego when you try to do it my way, you know, or my way or the highway, you know, boom. He just like fell over like that statue of Saddam Hussein. You know, when they pulled it down, it was boom. And, and so, you know, you, you practice with like in The Course of Miracles, it says, yeah, Holy Spirit, Decide for God, for me. You're literally throwing it onto your higher self, onto your spiritual guide and saying, you know the way. I will step back and follow you. Decide for God, for me. I always thought that was a great prayer uh, because you're, you're staying out of the way. In fact, he's got rules for decision where he gives you like seven rules for decision. But the first two are the most important where you decide the kind of day that you want and then you say, number two, if I make no decisions by myself, this is the day that will be given me. So simple. I want a happy day, a joyful day, a free day, a flowing day, whatever words you want to use. And if I make no decisions by myself, this is the, the day that will be given me. Then he gives you three, four, five, six, seven, for when you get off the beam and you forget one and two, you forget the one-two punch, and it's much harder to get back uh, once you've got off, off the track, once you've been derailed from the kind of day that you want and, and giving it over to the Spirit to, to lead the way. Then it gets really complicated. But part of that way back is to just start to say, at one point, when you're feeling upset, you know, you can start to say, I hope I've been wrong about this. You know, and what can it... What harm can it do to ask? You know, you, you have a little crack of willingness to say, I must have made a decision by myself. I must have asked a question by myself, which people always are asking me, when Jesus says that, what does that mean? What does it mean to ask a question by yourself? And the question underneath all upset is always this. Of these illusions, which do I prefer? 
That's what's going on. Anytime you're upset, your mind, the ego, is caught up into this gyration of, of these illusions, which do I prefer? And sometimes, our mind gets so riveted on a particular outcome. Let's say, you know, you just start dating this, this man or this woman, and they say they're going to call you on a particular day. And let's say it's 7 o'clock, and then 7 o'clock comes and you're sitting by the phone. And then 8 o'clock comes, and then 9 o'clock, and then 10 o'clock, then 11 o'clock. And you can be pretty worked up uh, before you go to sleep over this non-call. But it's just that the mind has decided an outcome by which it needs to have a happy day. You know, the, the outcome, like a call coming in, could be that simple. Or some of us, you know, know when you're, let's say, you're mowing the grass, and you, you run out of gas when you've only got, like, you know, ten more feet to go, and you go, ah! And then you, you try to go get gas, and the gas station's closed, and then you do this and this and this, well, and it, you end up having to go to sleep with a strip of grass that's like eight feet long or something, and if you go to bed upset, it's because you've already set the conditions by which you can have a happy day that, that includes having the grass mode, all of it. When you think, it's crazy. Who cares? It's a strip of eight feet of grass, you know, what does it matter in the overall scheme of things? But when the mind gets so riveted on a, on a particular illusion and decides that it needs to have that illusion come out a certain way to have a happy day, then you can drive yourself totally insane. Uh, on one little scrap like that.